Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Claridge, and welcome to another edition of Emergency Medicine Cases Rapid Review. Today, we're going to take you on a journey through the world of oncologic emergencies. There are four important presentations of oncological emergencies that we're going to review. First, we're going to take you on that approach to the febrile patient. Then we're going to look at those who come in with shortness of breath, those patients who have confusion, and those whose kidneys have shut down. But we'll save those for part two. All right, so let's get started. Oncological patients with a fever. What kind of things are you thinking about? Most of us will think of febrile neutropenia right off the bat. But the not-so-obvious stuff that you should think about are things like those patients with a large tumor burden, or those who have ongoing necrosis. Remember, pa these patients tend to have more transfusions than the general population, and so are on multiple medications that can cause fever. And lastly, keep in mind that sometimes pulmonary embolism can be associated with a fever. But what I want to do today is focus on febrile neutropenia. Let's break it down. The febrile part. A single oral temperature over 38.3, or over 38 for a one hour period. What about if it's documented at home? Still counts. These patients are usually recording regularly, so they'll know when it's abnormal. The neutropenic part. This is an absolute neutrophil count less than 0.5, or if it's less than 1 and expected to drop. Get the blood work early. If you can draw it at triage, get her done. Sometimes it can take the lab a while to do the counts. Communicate with the lab so they can get it done as quickly as possible. Recognizing febrile neutropenia is important. The risk of serious bacterial infection increases with the degree and the duration of the drop of the neutrophils. This usually occurs about 3 to 14 days after chemo, so ask when the last chemo dose was. Most patients have been educated about this and know exactly what will happen. Now that you've identified the febrile neutropenia, the next step is to identify the source. This is just like any other patient with a fever, so do your exam that you normally would do like examine the head, neck, chest, and abdomen, but here are a few pearls. The skin is very important. Look for signs of herpes simplex or zoster. Are there any signs of skin breakdown or abscesses? Also, check indwelling catheters for signs of infection. Check the oral pharynx for mucositis or thrush, and check the sinuses. Sinusitis is often overlooked but can be quite severe. Now what about a DRE? The experts recommend avoid doing this as it can promote infection, but do check the area for signs of abscesses. Lastly, if you're thinking appendicitis, think teflitis. This is a necrotizing enterocolitis where you have a loss of bowel wall integrity that leads to translocation of bacteria across. Get a CT scan, place an NG tube, and get medicine and surgery consults. Most patients will not have an identifiable source, so investigate broadly. Like what you're doing anyway for sepsis. Culture things, like the urine, the blood, and if they have a pick line, grab a sample from that as well. Remember to swab abscesses, wounds, and throat swabs from mucositis. Consider a chest x-ray. The IDSA says to do it if there's res respiratory symptoms, but keep in mind these patients may not present normally. Therefore, they may have subtle signs and also have symptoms and have a normal chest x-ray. After you get your cultures, get on the treatment. Your institution will have a protocol for these patients. More than likely, it would involve broad-spectrum antibiotics like Piptazo, Mirapenem, Inapenem. Get them in quickly. And if you think about the possibility of a line infection, add vancomycin. And consider it in cases where there's a history of MRSA or if they've got mucositis or if there's any recent antibiotic use. In really sick patients who are in septic shock, add an aminoglycoside. This adds more coverage for those gram-negative bugs. Remember, there could be other causative agents too not just bacteria. So if there's signs of zoster, start acyclovir. Fungal infections are a little more tricky, and we're probably not going to be managing it in the ED. But think about in cases where there's prolonged fever that are unresponsive to antibiotic therapy. Bottom line is, treat sepsis like you normally would. Get the antibiotics in, fluids going, and remember that they're often on steroids, so consider a stress dose. Let's move on to dyspnea. Again, just like in fever, it's important to have a good differential. Most of us will remember PE. They're going to be perk positive and have a positive dimer. 
For the most part, patients with an unclear etiology for their shortness of breath will end up getting a CT chest. Next, think about a lung tumor impeding their ability to oxygenate. Another relatively common problem is a pericardial effusion. It may be worthwhile to toss that probe onto the chest for a quick look. The last cause, and we'll talk about that in more detail, is SVC syndrome. SVC obstruction can occur acutely or subacutely, either by solid tumor or SVC thrombus. An increasingly prevalent cause are intravascular devices, like pacemakers or pick lines. It's a good one to keep in mind because it may present with subtle symptoms. It could just be a puffy face or facial redness, dyspnea or arm swelling, but it's important to recognize because it can lead to serious complications such as airway and cerebral edema. Back in med school, you might remember learning this sign. It's called Pemberton's sign, facial redness on elevation of the arms. Another physical exam finding is dilated superficial veins above the neck, but these usually occur with more subacute occlusions. To investigate, do a CT chest with contrast. You may also see abnormalities on the chest x-ray, but those are nonspecific. If you find someone with this, sit the patient upright and give oxygen. Those with strider from laryngeal edema or obstruction, or those with altered level of consciousness, may benefit from emergency endovascular stenting. Steroids and diuretics may be considered, but they're not likely to offer any major benefits. All right, so in summary, here are a few take-home points. Oncological patients with a fever, although you have to worry about febrile neutropenia, remember the differential. In febrile neutropenics, get the blood work early. Look in all the common spots, plus a few extra places. Treat similar to your sepsis patients. Start antibiotics ASAP, and remember to include Vanco for possible line infections. Those who are short of breath, they won't all be PEs, so think about the differential. Remember SVC syndrome and think about those subtle signs. Thank you for watching and see you again for part two.